the monarchs that we'll discuss. We'll discuss what might affect them and how they migrate, if they migrate at all. Um, and the reasoning behind that and maybe the evolutionary trends of migration in general. So it's about migration. Uh, tonight, I think we have a super moon. Has anybody been affected by that yet? <laughs> well, you know, it's just fairly close to the earth. So I think the, the interstitial fluid in my brain is swelling because I've been off all day. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, that's one of my topics here is to talk about things that affect you that maybe you don't think about every day. So I call these Zeitgebers or Zeitgeber, if you're proper German, I suppose. And these are time giver things that are environmental agents that give you a clue as to where you are in space and time. So for example, um, you have to synchronize all these with uh, your brain, with the environment. As you know, the earth goes around the sun. I think it's still true. So we call this sunrise and sunset, but of course there is no such thing as sunrise and sunset. There's just the spin of the earth around the sun at relatively the same angle around it, giving us the changes in seasons, as well as huge differences in, in what we're going to experience. So we haven't trained as an organism on a 24 hour period. That's our spin period. And we have light and dark cycles that vary depending on where you are in the earth. So if you look at North America, Central America and South America, those are quite different over the course of a year. We have four distinct seasons up here, just as they do down in Argentina. But when you get towards the equator, it's pretty much the same thing, unless there's a dry season and a wet season. So we have to train ourselves to understand these things and to see how they affect not us, not only us, excuse me, but monarch butterflies as well. So we are, you know, right over here with spring and summer, spring and autumn, excuse me. And you can see that the angle here, the spin on our axis is the same as it goes around here. But the amount of insulation or sun radiation that you receive is all about the location and where you are. Right now, we're abnormally warm, possibly because of climate change. Uh, and, you know, I have red buds that are blooming out there already. I've had birds here since, you know, late February uh, doing all their bird things that I don't know very much about. But nonetheless, uh, these are things that train us. We don't have an up and down in space. And our radiation is fairly constant from year to year. I, I know tonight that the geographic pole is slipping a little bit away from the magnetic pole. So that may change. And ultimately, we may have a flip that will affect birds and butterflies as well. So here we are, kind of like a bar magnet. Uh, the nice thing about magnetism is that it's very, very slight. Uh, the magnetism of the Earth here, as it goes around from pole to pole, is you know not very strong. So your, your bar magnet holding up a picture on your refrigerator is about 10 million times as strong as the magnetic field of the Earth. But nonetheless, it's something that you can use and butterflies can use and many organisms from bacteria all the way up to mammals use this kind of system. So this is the Zeitgeber itself. And things have not always been the same, as you know. <clears throat> so here's Michigan right here. Michigan was at one time buried in ice, maybe up to a mile thick. And it went way down here, all the way down to Kentucky, Tennessee. And you really didn't have any great force until you got down to near Florida. The actual continental shelf was much bigger. So this is only 14,000 years ago. Now, the bird diversity up here in Michigan was probably near zero at that time. And so was the butterfly diversity because we're waiting for things to come back after the glacial periods, which happened many times over the past few million years. So here's what it looked like. These are the Great Lakes being carved out. And these are jack pine forests that are normally found way up here. These have huge lakes out here. Lake Bonneville, for example, was an enormous lake. And yet down here, we have some warm temperate areas and we have some sand dune scrub forests down here, totally different than what we have today. So rather than tear this apart, and beat it to death. Look at Lake Bonneville up here in Utah. As big as Lake Michigan and much deeper than Lake Michigan. If you've ever gone to the Bonneville Flats, you know it's just a remnant of its former self. And that's happened in the past 15,000 years. These are all pluvial lakes that are formed when they break the dam, they all flood here. But now if you go out to these areas here, it's just pretty much desert, not very uh, 
very thick with vegetation. So against this background, we have three species of monarchs. We have Danius cleophyli, which is found in the greater Antilles up here, these two, uh, males and females. That's a common ancestor here. This one over here is a common ancestor for these two. Ours is called Danius plexippus plexippus. And this is Danius eripus. This is from South America. Now, if you saw these here, you would say, oh, I can tell the difference. It's quite different, right? Looks a little bit different. But if you saw them flying, you would never be able to tell the difference. So we have three close related species. It turns out that the, that the species Danius plexippus plexippus is the same on the west coast as well as the east coast. So it's considered to be the same species genetically, and yet there are some behavioral differences. So these monarchs are called Jamaican monarch, Danius cleophyli, Danius eripus is the South American monarch, and Danius plexippus is our monarch. That's the one that migrates. Some of these migrate in part, and some of these don't migrate at all, and ours migrates everywhere. It's become a common species pretty much throughout the world. So this is a chart of where we began, right here at this rooted tree of where things are going. This is Danius plexippus plexippus, or its ancestral version going over here to Hawaii and Samoa, Australia, New Zealand. This is called the Pacific Crossing. We also have that same species going to the Atlantic, to Spain, Morocco, and now into Africa, apparently. We have another group that goes into Central America, Belize, Bermuda, the Lesser and Greater Antilles, down to Ecuador. And up here, we have a number that are going into South America, the Queen, the Soldier, and of course, the South American Monarch. So I didn't want to go crazy on this thing. I just want you to show, show you that they're all related and they all share a fairly common gene pool and they all have zeitgebers that they can use either to migrate locally or to migrate latitudinally. So for example, South in South America, South in North America, and it's very unusual. What does this? So I, I put here, it's an opportunistic, highly vagal species. It moves around like crazy. It, it, it disperses through human assistance or by its own naturally dispersing ability. It's expanding its range in Europe and Africa and the Pacific Islands. Some of these migrate and some of these do not. So they can apparently lose their migratory ability. We don't know why, but it's a great spot for somebody to check out. So is this true for uh, Danius cleophyli? Not quite. And Danius eripus, normally they don't migrate, but you go down to Argentina where I'll take you shortly and you will see that they actually do. Now, what is migration? Good question, just like everything else. What does ecology mean? Well, Malcolm and Western Michigan University came up with this definition, predictable directional movement between separated resources. So we could go from the UP of Michigan all the way down to Michoacan in Mexico, and they have similar resources, but they're roughly 2000 miles as a crow flies distant from one another. You can predict this, you can depend on it. Uh, if you just have a temporal range expansion, you've probably seen some of these species like the Painted Lady, I'm thinking maybe you've seen that, the Red Admiral, the Spring, it's already been up here, and another tiny one I'll show you in a minute called Methallus Ioli. Those have temporal range expansions, but some people call those migrations. So for example, Vanessa Cardawai and Vanessa Atlanta are known to migrate around the world. So in Africa, I have seen Vanessa Cardawai the same species apparently is the one that is Arctic and exists around the world. These migrate up from the south every year. Where do you draw the line? I don't know. We can talk about it later on in the question section. Um, the temporal range expansion though could lead to a full evolution of the actual movement of butterflies, a true migration. It's just that we don't know when that would actually happen. We consider the monarch to be a migratory butterfly because our Eastern monarch flies all the way down to Michoacan, places there for roosting. And in the spring, it migrates back up partially, and then it has a generation, migrates up further and farther, excuse me. And then finally, it turns around like it's always been migrating up north, and then it goes south. That's a true migration. Here's Vanessa Cardoi. You will see these in butterfly gardens this year. This is a migrator. We didn't know how far it migrated, but it actually migrates sometimes farther than the monarch. So it comes from the central part of Africa all the way to the northern parts of Europe. It's a very common butterfly. You can buy these online. 
You can rear them on an artificial diet. If you ever want to do that, it's perfectly okay to release them. This is the red admiral in the same genus. This one migrates as well, sometimes 10,000 feet up in the air. Uh, and then it lands in Northern Europe, lays its eggs and migrates back down generation by generation back to Africa. And this is a cute one. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, the Nathalus Ioli. This one is actually, got, have you seen that? It actually goes all the way up to, um, to Traverse City and sometimes beyond, but it really doesn't inhabit this. It's only in the summer, then they all get killed by the frost and they're down in Kansas, down in Oklahoma, that sort of thing. It's really kind of a, um, not a tropical species, but it's kind of subtropical in a way. But we have those. Question, are these migrators as well? Well, we'll see a difference with monarchs that I'm gonna show you that these butterflies don't do. This one right here, the sulfur butterfly, very tiny. So this is a Chip Taylor, my old advisor's uh, map here, modified slightly in recent years from Monarch Watch. So it says North American flyways of Danius plexippus plexippus, that's our Eastern monarch. And you can see that in the summer, it's migrating up here, going all the way up to the uh, Eastern seaboard up there, all the way across wherever they can find milkweeds, they're gonna find that. And then it looks like this is a disjunct population here where these are monarchs from the West Coast and they're just flying down here. Now, we now know that these two groups are the same, the same genotype, virtually no variation. So you gotta think, okay, 14,000 years ago, if this is where they were all overwintering, you can see how easy it would be to spread up here in the spring, going northeast, and how easy it would be to go southwest in the fall. And what about these monarchs over here? Well, it's the same thing because right here in Arizona, some of these fly to the west to make roost over here on the Pacific Ocean, and others fly down to the Michoacan roost here near Mexico City. So we are a remnant, we're seeing a remnant of an explosion that happened 14,000 years ago. If you remember the glaciers came all the way down here and obviously milkweed was not growing on those glaciers or anywhere close to it. So the migration might've been a regional expansion like the Thales Ioli back and forth and up here. And then finally, when all this wet area gave up <clears throat> its water, um, all the lakes are gone as you can see pretty much. These guys are separated pretty much, but I've traveled through the Rocky Mountains here and uh, Robert Powell has done the same. We have seen monarchs up here. So there is some uh, reaching out of the gene pool, if you will, between these two populations. This is what's really strange though. You go down to South you know, Florida and they don't seem to migrate. However, a migration will take through Florida and go all the way to Cuba. And sometimes I think even to Cancun and places in Merida around uh, the uh, peninsula here they seem to mix with the native populations that don't migrate and nobody knows exactly what happens there. So there's lots of room for research if you want. So this is our species up here. So we have altitudinal migrations and we also have migrations that go up and down the mountaintop. So here, Danius Cleophily migrates in the Dominican Republic. That's at 19 degrees north. Remember that from lower elevations to the Cordillera Central, this is Pico Duarte. Believe it or not, they have a mountain that's 10,000 feet there. Uh, oops, I missed that one up. Uh, it has small overwintering roots. Now, I have not seen them in the pine forest up there. These are reminiscent of Danius plexippus and Michoacan. We have Megalipia in Costa Rica that migrate up and down the mountains during the wet season and dry season, according to Dan Jansen. And then we have this plexippus plexippus in New Zealand, which has migrations and also in Australia, which has migrations. So they haven't lost their migratory ability as they spread westward across the Pacific Ocean. Now, here's where, we're, here's where we are. These are all Eastern monarchs up here. And their focus is going down to Mexico City, right down here, and about 12 different routes that are right around Mexico City. There's a couple mountains there called Popocatapetl and Ixtasihuatl. Those are great names, they're in Nahuatl. But one of them was an ancient roost. It's now gone uh, and it's unfortunate, but the roosts are under incredible pressure down here because of illegal logging. And of course they have the drug trade that goes through there. It's pretty sad. Over here, Dominican Republic and Haiti and Hispaniola, we have Cleophily, 19 degrees north. Mexico City, 19 degrees north. I just want you to concentrate on that. Over here, we apparently have non-migratory species of 
of our Eastern monarch here, going down here and all the way down through here, but not through the great Amazon down here. They stop about Ecuador where I saw them several years ago. And then below that, below the Brazilian area here in what is called the Pantanal, the greatest wetland on earth, there are monarchs that migrate through down into Argentina from Bolivia as well down here across the Andes and down to some overwintering roost on their side, obviously it'd be the opposite down there, and no one's found the roost. So again, if you wanted to do some really cool research, you could go down there in a plane and look for these roosts in the wintertime. I'm sure they're there. I just don't know where they are. Here's the 19 degrees north I was telling you about Mexico City going right across here. Now keep this in mind because during the ice age, remember the continental shelf extends greatly. These are almost all interconnected here. And the same thing is true with Florida and the Keys over here and the lesser Antilles down here, not so much, but the greater Antilles up here quite a bit. Getting to South America. Up here, we have another subspecies so-called so of, um, uh, of our butterfly up here, the Eastern monarch, and down here, it goes down this far, Megalippi, it's called. I don't know how exactly it's different, but it apparently is somewhat. Down here in the Mato Grosso, there are butterflies that emerge to migrate through Paraguay, down in Argentina. If you go to the Folos du Iguazu in um, you know, the corners here of Paraguay and Argentina and Brazil, you will see many, many butterflies flying southwest in their fall, which is our spring. So they're going in the same direction, but it seems to me like that's the wrong direction, right? In our area, they go to Michoacan, which is still pretty temperate. They're at 10,000 feet. It's not too bad for the wintertime, but down here, you gotta find some area like that as well that we haven't found yet because it gets colder down here in Patagonia. So obviously they're stopping before that, but there are monarchs down there. I was at a really cool wildlife ranch there a long time ago. And there was a, a friend of mine named Lucas. He was a microbiologist and I said, well, Lucas, there aren't any monarchs down here. He said, oh, we have a lot of monarchs in our summer and they're all over the place. And I said, really? And he said, he said and they appear to migrate. I said, I've never heard of that, which is why you have good observers around the world saying, no, you're wrong. They're, they're actually here and they do seem to migrate. So I saw them at the Foz de Iguazu down here uh, just before Argentina and they were flying all along the Andes down here. I'll show you some pictures here in a second. Incredible butterflies. And Northwest Argentina has seasonal partial migrations. And by partial, I mean that they all don't migrate. Sometimes the migrators from the North fly through the ones that don't migrate and they probably breed with them. So as they get farther and farther away from the equator, the, the story changes quite a bit. So I just mentioned here where these butterflies are going. It's just the flip-flop of our season so far, but they fly from Bolivia, Paraguay and Brazil down to uh, Argentina. And you can, if you ever want to visit there, it's a very, very interesting place. It's beautiful. Salta, they call Salta the beautiful. And Hui, there's a, a, an area there that they migrate through and they crazy mass migration. You can actually uh, videotape them. So these are mixed flight patterns. We know that our monarchs up here in uh, Eastern North America, Western North America migrate. But you notice that the ones in the West Coast migrated to the Pacific coast there and they set up like a hundred different reserves, small, some of them are very small. And I'm gonna argue that that is an incomplete migration because monarchs don't seem to have a sense, a map sense, they just migrate. They go Southwest basically or Southeast, but they don't seem to know where Michigan is or Indiana or anything else. So on the West Coast, where can they go? Most of them can only go to the ocean and that's where they set up shop over winter in the eucalyptus trees there, which are not native, but have some biochemical similarity to some of the trees in Michoacan, the Oyamel fir and the white pines down there. So it's, it's incredibly interesting when you look at this caterpillar. Has anybody ever seen a caterpillar of a monarch butterfly up here? So you, you might notice that they're missing a white band right here. It usually goes, yellow, white, black, yellow, white, black. And down here, Arapus doesn't have it. This one's also feeding on a vine. It's, it's like a milkweed, it's, a, it's Morania, 
and uh, it's in the LCNACE, it's just like the milkweeds are, they've changed that group somewhat, but it's really interesting because you find these next to vineyards down there and the vineyards of course are beautiful and the wine is excellent. So if you ever want a great trip going down there, especially in the spring. Now this is an Arapis down here in South America. It's brand new. It was in March of uh, a few years ago when I was down there. But looking at it, you could not tell the difference behaviorally or even at a distance the phenotype from our monarchs up here. This is brand new and they don't always migrate. Some of the old ones from north of them do migrate through and they will, they will mate with these down here and lay more eggs. So it's, a, it's an interesting crossroads. These are huge quebradas. These are uh, rivers that flow through ancient hills here. This is where they're finding all the cool dinosaurs, by the way, is down here just south of where this is right here. Back here are the Andes. These are the foothills of the, of the Andes. Uh, they have a, their own forest types and everything. And they will fly down here, down the rivers like this. And when they get to certain spots where they want to elevate, they will do this strange circling motion that I will show you in a few minutes here. So cohorts of migratory monarchs, we have the East Coast ones, that's us, right? Uh, we have the central flyway ones that are going down the central area of the United States and then the West Coast. Uh, they seem to have slightly different migratory pathways, but they all make it to Michoacan. And they go there by the hundreds of millions in a good year. We're down to like 30 million, I believe, uh, in the past year. Uh, it's down quite a bit, but um, I'll show you a video here that they're amazingly uh, common down there. So what are these adaptations? I'm going to run through this. They have a juvenile hormone, which, which keeps in juvenile. They enter a diapause. They will not mate or lay eggs late in the season, although you can find some that do. Generally speaking, they don't. They take their sugars and they make fat out of them. Fat um, is great for weight because you get twice as many calories per gram as you do for sugar. They have longer, more angular wings. They have a change in their wing shape. Their gliding proficiency may improve. They've got this collagen four subset one, just like we do, which allows them stronger muscle contractions. And then they have the ability to form temporary uh, roost during their migration, sometimes on maple trees, who knows what else. I've seen them up at Beaver Island by the hundreds in these roosts. Uh, some people claim in Kansas, for example, that uh, the same trees, same maple trees are used every year. And what else? Ad adaptations, they're deficient. I think I went through that. Uh, excuse me. They can now time compass the sun. So that means they know where east and west is relative to the position of the sun. They have this crazy area of their eyes called the, uh, the dorsal uh, rim area here. And that's what they can see ultraviolet light with. They can rely on these crazy genes called CRY1, the cryptochromes, that are also found in plants that time their flowering period in bacteria, so they're very ancient genes. They have, to, they have to calibrate where they are though, right? Because if you're in Michigan, you're not in, you're not, for example, in Massachusetts. And if you're in, if on the west side, you're, you're obviously not in the central part of the range. So we have to figure out where we are using these zeitgebers. And here's the best. Now I'm not gonna show you all this because it's too difficult to go through, but basically here's the sun, Here's an antenna clock. We didn't know they had a clock, but this is a circadian rhythm. They can read the time literally with it. Here's a dorsal rim of the eye where they can see ultraviolet light. And over here, the main retina picks up the different colors. They bring in all these information cues of where they are and what they're doing. And they bring that to the central brain region. There's literally just four cells there that integrates all the information coming in from the antenna and from the sun here to the main retina and the dorsal rim area. And then they decide, should we migrate or, or not? So they look at the angle of the sun in the sky. Now underneath all that are all these genes and these clock-like patterns that are working here. So we have clock, we have period genes, cryptochromes, et cetera. We won't go into that, but that's the underlying mechanism of this entire incredibly fascinating group of insects. So we sense skylight, skylight cues, the main retina, the azimuth position of the sun from the north, and then we have these really weird little areas called the dorsal rim area that can pick up plane polarized UV light. They go to the CC complex, the central brain complex, and that brain complex figures out where's the sun compass? What kind of light's coming through? Is it a rainy day? Is it a sunny day? And they have to use all those to figure out where they are. 
Now, here's what they do. If you go to a lake like Lake Michigan, if you go to a high elevated area here and you let the butterflies go, let's say late August, mid-September, even into October, the butterfly will flap up. Oh, I lost it. Uh, I don't know how to get back to that. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so um, I'm not sure where I am here. Um, you're on the slide with the... Okay, All right, here we go. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you the counterpart of this, but basically what they do is they fly up in circles, and this is flapping flight. This is not gliding, looking for thermals. And you can see up here, they're going around, and then they switch and they go around here, and they always know where they are. So if I release them at 10 o'clock, they would take the same pattern. 12 o'clock, they take the same pattern. 4 o'clock, they take the same pattern. Even at night, they take the same pattern. They know where they are in time and space. Now, what does that look like here? Well, here we go. I hope you can see this. This is, anybody know where this is? Grand Rapids? <laughs> okay, so watch this. Here's the butterfly, it's gonna drop. Now, see how it flies up there? Going around. I'm trying to follow because I always lose it. And then it does a reversal. And then it flies over here. I hope you can see it. Coming over here, you almost lose it right there. It's still flapping hard. It does another reversal. See how it's going like that? And there it is. And finally, you can follow it down. At, this might be at 5,000 feet or higher. And then finally, it goes down to an area over Grand Rapids, which is directly southwest from where it was released. So this is a clue that they are doing some kind of mechanical flight, not to gain altitude necessarily, because if they wanted to do that, they would do that just like all the other butterflies I've released. They would fly in a straight line and go straight up. But this butterfly and Vanessa Cardoi, the painted lady, do these unique circles. And if you ever had an iPhone or ever any other kind of phone, smartphone now, all you gotta do is take your phone to get your compass working is move it in a figure eight. And that's exactly what these guys do over here. So it's very interesting when you map this out with circular statistics, you will see that they tend to fly exactly kind of southwest from where they were. I can't seem to find this here either, but I'll just click on this. These are monarchs that I'm showing you because I wanna show you the function of wings. Just because they have the um, actual uh, black lines on their veins does not mean that they're regulating their body temperature with that. In fact, it has nothing to do with that. They are use these as episomatic warning colors for predators. Uh, they use these for flight. And notice that the wings are way down over here. Um, are you guys, you guys still with me? Okay, I just wanna make sure. So these wings can be used for flight, they can be used for sex attraction, they can be used for temperature regulation, they can also be used to get the butterfly to an area where they can actually see all the Zeitbergers I've been talking about. So Michigan is a very central part of this whole thing. If you go up north, you know that there's millions of monarchs that are produced there every year. Some of these go on after the migratory period starts at the end of August so that there are overlapping generations of these butterflies. And many thousands of these migrants die along our coastline, as I'm sure you've seen in the past here. Here's some of Beaver Island that shows you a really torn um, male mating with a brand new female. So this male is probably six to eight weeks old. And this one over here is probably a few days old. They will squeeze off another generation up there at Beaver Island to that. Here's what happens to many of them when they try to cross the lake too late at night or too late in the afternoon. Uh, these are ladybird beetles, Asian ladybird beetles. They will consume these bodies. Sometimes you can find monarchs like every 10 feet. So that must mean millions of these during a, a late storm um, are dying. And part of the reason is they try to fly across the lake when the sun is getting near the setting. So they have that glare of uh, polarized light coming off the water. The glare confuses them, I think, and they end up in the water, and of course they die there. 
Now, where do these guys go? Well, they go to southwest facing roosts in the neovolcanic range, 19 degrees north latitude, as I pointed out before. They, they uh, end up at a number of different sites, like El Cinqua is a really good one. El Rosario is a good one, but it's too you know, popularized. So I don't like it that much. But every year they do this by sun compassing, biomagnetism, or other physical environmental cues. And of course, they're obviously in places where uh, visitors can visit because if they weren't in the same spots every year, you would have no tourism, but you have plenty of tourism to see these. If you had gone there maybe 20 years ago, you could see 100, 150 million monarchs there. Now, um, for some reason, I cannot find the toolbar here, but um, anyway, I'd like to go back to that, but I can't seem to do that. Um, can't find my cursor. Is it? Oh no, wait, hang on a second here. Uh, there, it's just not working. There we go. Okay, we're not there, not there. We're gonna be right, right here. This is the intergenerational one I was telling you about. Death of monarchs and where they were they, where they roost. Uh, when things go wrong in the roost here, I wanted to show you this video, but maybe it's not going to work. We're just seeing a blank screen there. Yeah, that's what I figured. Okay, that's not going to work. So um, I didn't expect my cursor to get lost like that. Here we go. But I don't have, here we go. Now we're going to be good. Okay, hang on, sorry about that. Here we go. This is at a roost in 2002 when they had that huge freeze down there. We were unlucky enough to see this freeze. I was hoping to see this, the monarchs down there, but here it is. Okay, now this is in Chinqua, uh, Michoacan, Mexico. Let's see if this works. Give it a second. Remember, there's so many monarchs down here that they actually break limbs off the trees. Very soon. You may not hear the sound, but that's what it looks like when you look up from the roost. They're basking. You can see that they're holding their wings pretty much like they would be flying. They're never completely open. And I think what they're doing is they're exercising their flight muscles. There's no other reason to do this. They're not getting nutrition. They're not getting water. They're just flying. And this is not yet spring. So all these orange color things you see there are butterfly roosts. And the die off created you know, just a foot and a half deep of water is all dead on the forest floor. These are false white pine down there. They're not mating, this is not a mating dance. And here's what the boughs look like of the trees. They're just burdened with them. Here's what they look like on the tree trunks. And these many, many millions die over the course of the winter. They're eaten by orioles and other birds. They rip them apart, take their fat bodies. Mice prey on them. So they don't take the cardiac glycosides from eating the body themselves. They just strip the fat out. They're beginning to mate. This is almost in March. And their mass migration back uh, begins around the 21st, about the first day of spring. This particular year, there was probably 20 million monarchs in this one roost, lining the trees, lining the branches, and of course, many, many died. It could be that they died from, you know, the long distance migrations from Michigan. This is what it looks like and it has a very musty smell. So we think that perhaps um, 
the death of all these monarchs and the rot that happens afterwards is attractive to these roosts to the next generation coming down the following year. If you could imagine acres and acres and acres of dead butterflies, that's what it looks like. This is partly due to climate change and partly due to other reasons we don't know. So this is the plug for Monarch Watch. If you have any spare dollars, you can give it to Monarch Watch. They will love to have you. Here's a monarch feeding it, um, some plant here. Looks like Leatris, but I don't think it is. So let's go back to our map. We have spring migration coming back up here to the summer, but by generation. So generation, 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 generation. Sometimes we get five generations of monarchs up here in one year. It depends on the weather though. Down here, the same kind of thing. But as I said, they fly towards the Pacific coast here, but they have nowhere to go. They can't go anywhere else. And for that reason, I call that an incomplete migration. It's the same pattern as over here. And it is the same species, but they're trying to go here and they can't go here from there. What they can do though, is if you're ambiguous in Arizona, for example, you could follow westerly winds over here, or you could fly all the way down here. So there are not that many that go there, but the fact is that these gene pools, butterflies, are mixing from both west sides and the east side. Hence the genetic information that says they're a single good species. When they come up in the spring, if you look at the fritillary butterflies in a cage, you will see that they orientate every square in a cage that's got four quadrants to it. If you look at monarchs, that Danius plexippus, you'll see that they're all facing east. And even stranger, in the fall, they all line up right along this line here facing southwest. It's really amazing. Just like you saw in that video, they're all lined up. Over here, they're in a dispersal pattern, it looks like. So that's why I say this species is constantly migrating, at least in our neck of the woods. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Remember, they can see polarized light from the moon, just as they can see polarized light from the sun. And it's virtually in the same um, intensity at some times. So what we have here is during the Pleistocene, you know, at the end of it, 14,000 years ago, we have this area here, the continental shelf reaching down to Cuba over to Hispaniola. And remember over here is Danius Cleophile. Oops, sorry. I don't know why this is doing that. It must be me. Danius Cleophile over here. This is, Air, this is a Plexippus going up here, and this is Erepus going down here. So right here is where I think these guys were born, literally, in the evolutionary sense. And they all had some partial ability to migrate. Some of them migrate, for example, Pico Duarte here in Hispaniola up to the mountains. And the same thing is true down here in Panama, Costa Rica. And others become sedentary here and up here. And then down below there, as they go towards the higher latitudes, um, say 49 degrees or 45 degrees north, like we are up here, 45 degrees down here south, you will see that they begin migrating again. So it's got to have something to do with the latitude as well. I just don't know what it is. But up here, they'll migrate. Down here, they'll migrate. Here, it's really iffy. They don't necessarily migrate at all. And in the crossroads up here, you will see that some are sedentary populations. You can find them breeding in Texas over the winter as well as South Florida. And the migrators just come right through that. Same thing is true with Argentina, same kind of situation. So here's my brief explanation. We have Danius Cleophile. That's the originator, as I showed you in that dendrogram very early on in the talk. This is like 2 million years ago, separated by genetics from the other two. That gives rise maybe to Danius Erepus, Danius Plexippus. And of course, the migration is restricted by the advance of the ice sheets in both continents so that they become more sequestered in the north of South America and in the south of North America, where they experience some kind of range expansion as well as an actual expansion and turns into a migration. So there's lots of things that have to happen, but apparently the migrating ability of our subspecies is the thing that's getting them across to Africa and over to the Antilles and over to Asia, it's, it's gonna continue, you can bet on this. So there's the birthplace right here, right there.
course, all this is gone pretty much, but it's still there. And you can find sedentary monarchs of our species here, over here, over here, and then the rest of this would have been Cleophily territory, you know, a couple millions of years ago. And that is all I have. I was trying to keep it relatively short, but apparently I went over. So I'm open to any questions that you might have. <laughs> yeah, you didn't go over. You did great. That was that was wonderful. Well, thank you. All right, so let me, um, if you would like to unmute, you can do so and ask a question. And I, I'll go ahead and start it off. This is something we discussed before we started the meeting tonight. Um, and I, I know you just presented on Monarchs, but this will, based on the answer you gave me earlier and for the just general club, um, what kind of vegetation would draw not just the pollinators, the, the Monarchs, but would also draw birds to our our homes, our property, to land. Okay, well, earlier in our board meeting tonight too, and Scott, something Scott um, presented. So Scott, this is your question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go, Scott? No, I, well, Matthew, it's for you, but yeah, if Scott, you want to ask it too, that's fine. Well, what he said was something we were talking about earlier, so that's why he said it was my question. <laughs> but if you can go ahead and answer it. <laughs> well, for me, since I have a butterfly garden, I also have many, many birds here, not only because of the plants I've got here, but because of the insects that will you know, attack my plants. So I believe the best ones, of course, are the native plants because they have the most insect biodiversity and therefore we get the most birds because of that. I only live in like a third of an acre, but I think I have probably had 35, 40 species of birds here or through here or nesting here. And I, I think that's pretty good for a suburban area like that. But I think the key is water and deep throated plants, you know, if you want hummingbirds, that kind of thing. But also birds will investigate uh, seeds from, you know, all the, um, what am I trying to think of? All the aster type flowers, those are really good to have. As well as some non-natives like Buddleia. Buddleia is great for butterflies and moss and then birds attack them on the buddleias. So if you if you want to form a whole ecosystem, you got to think of the fact that uh, butterflies and moss and all other insects need larval food plant. So the larval food plant will be largely native plants with some exceptions like buddleia. And if you want nectar to bring all the other insects in, you're going to have to have nectiferous plants as well. Uh, and you know they have they have areas on the internet where you, it tells you how to design a garden yourself, but really it's just water uh, and picking native plants and then making sure you got a, enough nectar bearing plants to attract the insects. And once you've got that, of course, you got to have some trees too. A lot of people cut the trees down and they probably should leave them uh, because in our property, our trees are loaded with birds and it's from morning to sunset. Even right now I can see birds out here. I hope that answers the question. Probably not very well, but just get rid of your grass. You don't really need it. Yes. <laughs> yes. I propose 